Louise Rennie, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Sam. So we were just chatting before and I was explaining this is the very first interview that I've done as part of this show. And I really could not think of a better first guest, particularly as a San Francisco politics nerd who grew up hearing about your career. So thanks again. Oh, thank you. Thank you again for having me. Of course. So I wanted to start with when you first entered public life um, in 1978. And for folks that aren't from San Francisco, they may not know that that was a deeply traumatic year um, for our city. And I wonder if you can just briefly explain what happened that year and then how you came to be appointed to the board. Well, as, as you say, 1978 really was a tumultuous year. Um, it was sort of preceded that, first of all, um, there had been a campaign to unseat Chief Justice Rose Byrd, who was the first woman to be appointed to the California Supreme Court. So that was going on. There had been that campaign going on, which she won. But then at the same time, there was the Jonestown massacre, for lack of a better word, where thousands of people from San Francisco went to Jonestown and were killed, and where now Congresswoman Jackie Speer was severely wounded. And so that was very traumatic for the city. But the crowning blow, if you will, was that Mayor Moscone and Supervisor Harvey Milk were assassinated by Dan White, who was then a a supervisor as well in San Francisco. So you can imagine the just overwhelming shock that occurred uh, within San Francisco. Well, after the assassination of Mayor Moscone and uh, uh, Harvey Milk, then Diane Feinstein, who was president of the Board of Supervisors, was selected to become the mayor of San Francisco. And so that's how Diane Feinstein, now Senator Feinstein, became mayor of San Francisco, which, just as an aside, I will say she did an excellent job. But then somebody had to take her seat on the Board of Supervisors. And at that time, we had district elections. So Diane had said that uh, she would be wanting the input of the neighborhood associations and some of the merchants' associations. And through a series of circumstances, uh, my name was put in the hopper, and I was recommended to the mayor to become a member of the Board of Supervisors. Now, I had been in politics a bit before that, but um, my husband and I had worked on Bobby Kennedy's campaign, for example, and as I indicated, I was very involved in the Rose Bird campaign to make sure she remained. But in terms of actually being an elected official or anything of that nature, uh, it was a first step for me. But the mayor did appoint me to take her place on the Board of Supervisors. And um, at the same time, uh, she asked if I would give up my practice of law Um, To be honest about it, I had been so busy with the Rose Bird Camp, (laughs) I'm afraid my practice had kind of gone downhill. And so that's how I uh, became a member of the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. And I would say she and then uh, others on the board, uh, we had to work quite hard just to make sure that there was stability. And of course, it wasn't too long after that that we had Prop 13 hit, which was a tax measure that re- significantly reduced measure. So all in all, it was 1978 was clearly um, quite a year for San Francisco and, and for me personally, as it turned out. Yeah, you mentioned Diane Feinstein and this horrific episode really ultimately became part of her political story. It elevated her to becoming the mayor um, when she ran for governor. Uh, In 1990, she made an ad called Forged from Tragedy. And I wonder if you can just speak to her leadership at that moment and also what your personal relationship like was with her. Well, there's just no question and uh, that uh, I'm going to call her Diane, if I may, whether it's uh, you you have permission. Mayor Feinstein was a superb mayor. I mean, just a superb mayor. Uh, She was a true leader, as she is today. 
And she really took an appropriate hands-on approach to how the city was governed. Just one small example, but an important one. Every Monday morning, there was a department head meeting. And the idea was to go over what were the issues of the moment for the city, uh, what did the police department need, how could one department help another department, and there was real coordination. And I can remember a couple of times, too, I'd be riding with the mayor, going someplace, and should see something on the street, and she would say to whoever was driving the car, stop, let's, let's take a look and find out what's going on there, and we would. Or she would tell him, look, you better call the police or call whoever the department had to get on that right away. And so I, I just think that she was an outstanding mayor, just uh, in her leadership and her caring. And, of course, I, I also have to bring up the time when, uh, when there was a jury verdict and Dan White uh, wasn't fully convicted, if you will, of the murder of, of Harvey Milk. And there was a huge riot, just a huge riot in front of City Hall with cars being burned, etc. And Jack Molinari, the mayor was very close to Jack. I would say the mayor and Jack and I were were working very close together. Jack was the president of the Board of Supervisors. I was chair of the finance committee. And so the three of us worked very closely. We were in City Hall that night. And um, if you've ever been in a riot or close to a riot, it is totally frightening. It is a very frightening experience. I can remember, for example, that another member of the Board of Supervisors who thought that she had a particularly good uh, relationship, if you will, with some of the people who were out demonstrating, said, don't worry, I'll go out, I'll quiet them down. Well, <laughs> I can tell you she was back in City Hall in a jiffy because the crowd was in no mood for any sort of uh, compliance, if you will. Yeah. So I think Diane, when she was mayor, had quite a number of experiences, but she was just an excellent mayor, in my opinion. In terms of the broader political climate of the city, did the city come together? Was there unity sort of in the wake of this horrific tragedy or were the divisions only deepened? I, I believe the city came together. There was a feeling that, for lack of a better word, we're San Francisco strong. I, I don't know if that was the I phrase that at way. that time, but, <laughs> but I think yeah. it sort of uh, is the case that um, I think Diane really brought us together. And there were a lot of really good supervisors at that time, too. Uh, there was Doris Ward. Uh, there was Ella Hill Hutch, who was the first black woman supervisor on the board. Doris Ward, who a uh, black supervisor. We had Harry Britt, who was appointed to take uh, Harvey Milk's place. And Harvey... And Diane and others worked very hard on the AIDS crisis, which is actually a whole nother story in and of itself. But I think that uh, everybody worked together to deal with that crisis as well. Yeah. And I want to pick up again on your story. You mentioned you were chair of the Finance Committee. And then in 1986, then Mayor Feinstein appointed you to the office of city attorney. And obviously, you would go on to change the face of that office and also of, of municipal law around the country. But I wonder, how did you think about that office in 1986 when you were first appointed? What was it known for? What was the culture? Well, um, what had happened, just by way of background, is that the city attorney, who had been ill for a while, died. And so the mayor appointed me to take his uh, position. Uh, one thing I found out was that as city attorney, you really know what's going on in the city. <laughs> I think sometimes more than the mayor or the board of supervisors. But when you think about it, San Francisco is both a city and a county, which means a city traditionally handles police and fire. A county will handle health and social services. But when you're both the city and a county, you literally are representing departments, I say, from A to Z. In San Francisco's case, 
from the airport to the zoo with police, fire, health, and everything mixed in between. And so it's quite a large job. I'm not sure I had realized at the time what a huge job it was. But um, when I first got there, because the former city attorney had been ill for so long, the, 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 the basic premises were kind of messy, like the, the conference room where the public was, there were broken chairs and that sort of thing. So the first thing I did was to tell everybody, look, we've just got to get this place cleaned up. So I said, we're going to take a day, clean up our offices, get our filings filed and all that sort of thing. And I could just feel some of them rolling their eyes. Oh boy, this is what happens when you get a woman to, to take over the office. But, um, but really, I think it made a difference. And ironically, one of the things that I did was, uh, you know, technology at that time was, was really in its early stages, but we did have some technology. And that night I had, it, I had the whole system backed up. Well, lo and behold, the next day, the person who had been in charge of all our technology had a heart attack and died. So, you know, if we would not have had that backed up, who knows, would have been pretty far behind. But uh, I think the we had the uh, number of just excellent, excellent lawyers. Uh, we had them within the office, and then we had a number of lawyers that wanted to join the, the office. And so we had some excellent, excellent lawyers in that office, no question about it. And, and pretty soon after taking over that office, you did another thing that made it clear that there was new leadership, which is you very famously sued the Olympic Club, which for those who are not from San Francisco, they don't know, is an exclusive, historically all-male golf and social club in the city. Tell me about that case and, and how you got it. Well, um, the, the two, two stories related to the Olympic Club. First of all, um, one of, uh, at that time, senior attorneys, John Holtzman, uh, who's now my law partner in yeah. private practice, had said, you know, city attorneys traditionally defend the city, but he thought there was a real role in terms of doing affirmative litigation on behalf of consumers and taxpayers. So while he was sort of whispering that in one of my ears, in my other ear was a very good friend, Drew Ramey, who was a feminist, an activist, and she said, you know, Louise, it isn't right that the Olympic Club, this prestigious golf club in San Francisco, is discriminating against women and people of color. And so I looked into it, and what I discovered was that and when you play golf, you have 18 holes. Well, three of the holes that the Olympic Club were playing on were on city property, Reckon Park city property. So I contacted the club and I said, you know, you have a choice. You can either open up your doors to women and people in color and play on 18 holes, or you'll just have to play on 15 holes. You gave them an ultimatum. <laughs> As you can imagine, that did not go over very well. Right. In fact, my poor husband is the one who bore the brunt. Oh, that they—I guess they felt by getting being mean to him, they could get to me. But anyhow, it did end up in litigation, ultimately settled. And ironically, as the years have gone by, there have been women who have been the presidents. And uh, some years later, too, I've had a couple of men call me thanking me because their daughters were now members of the Olympic Club. And yeah. just this past year, the uh, ladies PGA, the highest ranking women's yeah. tournament, was held at the Olympic Club. And Paul and I were invited to, to the tournament. So we went and it was great fun. Yeah, that's a great story. You, you mentioned that Paul's circle of friends weren't so happy about this. How did the boys club and the political establishment react to your decision just a year in, really, into office to, to make this your fight? Well, as I say, there were a number of people that were very upset that uh, we took this position. By the same token, there were a lot of people who were very happy 
because, uh, you know, I think any club is better off when there's diversity, just like, you know, I'm engaged in some lawsuits now trying to bring better diversity to corporate boards where the studies show that businesses do better when there's diversity. So um, I, I think it was the right decision that we sued the Olympic Club. I think it's worked out very well for the Olympic Club. And if you take a look at across the country or even internationally, so many clubs that formerly were exclusive and not considering people of color or women now are, are open, uh, opening their doors to increase diversity, which is, can only be a good thing. Yeah. You talked about that that transition from having a defensive posture to trying to execute an affirmative agenda. And that's interesting. I, I hadn't heard that John was the voice in your ear because, you know, that strategy is really associated with your your legacy and your work. I wonder were other city attorneys or sort of the you know other municipal lawyers around the country taking notice and trying to implement their own affirmative agendas? Well, the, there are a number of city attorneys that uh, are are looking at those cases. One of the cases, in addition to the Olympic Club that we were in the forefront, was on tobacco litigation. And I remember very clearly there was a man at UC, uh, UCSF, named Stan Glantz. And I remember very clearly that the day he came into my office along with another uh, attorney to explain how the tobacco companies were targeting young people and getting them to smoke so they would become addicted and become lifelong customers, if you will. And so we filed one of the first suits as a government entity against uh, the tobacco companies seeking to get rid of Joe Camel ads and the, the RJ Rental ads. And uh, we actually ended up winning those cases. And then about the same time, the Mississippi Attorney General was the first to sue the tobacco companies for purposes of uh, health purposes that that uh, the tobacco companies were impacting. And of course, we had San Francisco General. So we had a coalition of cities and counties up and down the state of California that we sued the tobacco companies as well. So we had two lawsuits, basically, against the the tobacco companies. So the end result was, first of all, all the tobacco ads are gone, the movies, etc., are gone. And then there was a national settlement, I think this was 1998, between the tobacco companies and all of the state attorney generals, where there were certain restrictions on tobacco use. And as part of that settlement, what was unusual in California was because the local entities we had sued and not the attorney general, uh, uh, some of the a big number of the proceeds actually have gone to cities and counties in California. And in San Francisco, what we did was to use that money to rebuild Laguna Honda Hospital, which is one of the few skilled nursing facilities in the country. Yeah, I want to I want to linger on that point because it's so fascinating to me. I, I think what you did is you went to the then mayor Willie Brown and you said, "I want to tie the settlement money to rebuild this particular hospital." And then you got a bond measure passed that that did exactly that. And I think there's a political lesson there too, as well, right? It's it's a tangible outcome for voters to see where the settlement money goes, as opposed to having a faceless sort of bureaucracy. And I wonder. Obviously, you love that hospital, but was was there a political strategy there too to make sure people understood what what the money was going toward? Well, uh, yes, I I always felt strongly that the money should be used for health purposes. That was the basis of our our lawsuit. Fast forward to today, Sam. There are are two big cases going on right now. One are the opioid cases where you have cities and counties across the country that have sued Purdue Pharma and other manufacturers. Ironically, the main judge involved in this, Judge Polster in Ohio, has made it very clear that unlike the tobacco money, which could be used for any purpose, I'll be 
we didn't do that in San Francisco, but in any settlements and or jury verdicts, any monies going for opioid settlements must be used for opioid abatement purposes. So if you take a look at all of the uh, settlements that have been achieved to date in the opioid litigation, you will see that they are tied to opioid abatement practices. And they're somewhat specific, albeit general, uh, to what they might be. I might just mention another current proceeding that is, is going on that's tied to the tobacco litigation, and that's Juul, Juul yeah. where there is major litigation going against Juul because what they have done is they literally took a page out of the tobacco pages and are targeting kids to vape. And so there are multiple lawsuits against Juul uh, because of targeting kids and getting them to vape. And vaping has nicotine in it and kids can get addicted and they do. And it's ironic that uh, today, I actually am involved both in the opioid cases representing San Francisco and in the Jewel case where the San Francisco Unified School District is one of several suing Jewel and Alt well, Altry had bought a portion of Jewel. And I remember when I was first contacted about the Jewel case and I could just see the same pattern that had occurred in the tobacco case. And I thought, oh my gosh, they're at it again. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about this because I wonder, you, you mentioned the California State Attorney General either didn't join the, the tobacco case or didn't join until very late. Are we seeing a similar thing now where it's city attorney's offices that are leading the charge? I mean, w what do these lawsuits look like? Well, um, in both the opioid and the jewel cases, what you've seen, the cities and the counties have been at the forefront. They have been the first to get involved. Now that said, the state attorney generals have now joined the bandwagon, if you will, and are very involved in some of the settlements. For example, uh, in the opioid cases, a lot of the states did not sue uh, the distributors. They only sued the manufacturers. But when with the distributor settlement, by now, you have virtually every state attorney general on board, at least involved in the settlements. And so they're getting, the AGs have been uh, very active in the opioid thing. And in California, we have um, a good working relationship with the state attorney general's office in terms of working out the details of how the monies for the distributor settlements are going to be allocated. And uh, so that I think was a very important step. And I suspect in Juul, many of the state attorney generals will become more and more involved. But so far in Juul, as far as government agencies, it's been primarily the school districts because they're the ones most affected. Are these partisan issues? Are we seeing Democrats more willing to be aggressive on them? Because especially with opioids, it feels like this is an opportunity for bipartisan work. You know, I, I have to say um, that in both the opioids and the Juul cases, there may be some differences among the state attorney generals, but I would say no, when it comes, it's very clear that when it comes time to getting money, everybody <laughs> is willing to say, oh, it doesn't make any difference if you're a Republican or a Democrat. And uh, so I would just say, from my perspective at least, have there been any partisan manifestations? Maybe some, but has it hindered how the settlements have ended so far? No. No, I, this, is, this has been, um, for the most part, I think, pretty collegial. In fact, I would have to say I would like the Congress to act a little bit more <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like some indeed. of the states and the cities and counties have worked together, uh, both opioids and Juul, but certainly in opioids. Yeah. 
Now, I want to come back to some of these contemporary cases, but I also don't want to lose the thread of your story. So I'm going to bring us back to 1990. And that was the year that you publicly acknowledged that you had been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, And that was no small thing to do in 1990 as um, a sitting uh, city attorney and a woman sitting city attorney. I wonder if you could talk about that decision and and how you came to it. I, um, it's very interesting. I, I, I obviously when, at least in those days when you uh, had breast cancer, the, the chemotherapy was pretty serious and you lose all your hair. And, uh, and I was going into work every day, but it was becoming noticeable that I was losing my hair. And I had a very good working, and still do, a good working relationship with Mayor Art Agnos. So he stopped, he came out, he said, Louise, are you okay? And I said, well, I'm really not. And I told him, he said, well, let's go public with this. Let's go public. And I said, that's a great idea. So we arranged a press conference at the American Cancer Society, and we had my doctor and my family and Art Agnos, and we, uh, you know, I essentially said, look, everybody, I have breast cancer, and we need to all speak up about this because it's nothing to be ashamed of. It isn't something that's anybody's fault, but, you know, we all need to get our mammograms, and so I, it was really quite a, 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 a conference. And I have to say that I was very touched. I remember one time I was in the parking garage and I got on the elevator and this one woman said, thank you so much for speaking out. She said, I've been afraid to do it, but now I'm not afraid anymore. So that was very touching. But I, you know, I have to get my husband was, oh, just, you know, wonderful my and, and my daughters and and I had a great doctor and I said Art Agnos was wonderful and so uh, I would say that that was a team effort there a team effort <laughs> well I was really struck by this because I think you might have said in an interview when you left uh, being the city attorney that this was one of your proudest moments and I think it's interesting because you know the law is a tool to make change, but so is having a political platform and letting people know about information they might not know. Um, and I think this is a good example of the intersection of law and politics. Um, so I want to move forward a couple years, somewhere in the '90s, maybe in the wake of um, in the wake of the tobacco settlement, or maybe in 2000, um, you hired a young assistant district attorney from the Alameda County District Attorney's Office, um, and that young ADA was Kamala Harris. Um, And she later said, you know, when Louise calls, you got to pick up. Uh, So I'm wondering what your first impressions were of her, how you recruited her, and what she was like to work with. Um, I I had known Kamala just socially. I would see each other at uh, various occasions. And then when um, she left the Alameda DA's office, at the time, I had an opening in what I called Family and Children's Services Division. And this is a, a, a part of the city attorney's office that a lot of people don't realize, but there is a whole group of uh, abused kids or kids that fall have to be taken from their home, families that have issues that end up in court, foster care, etc. And you need somebody who has, for lack of a better word, the right touch, somebody who not only is a good lawyer and knows what the rules and how you follow them, but can really be uh, sympathetic to the families and the children involved in, in, you know, a court setting is not a happy occasion very often. And so I thought uh, Kamala would be quite good. And I, we had lunch and I said, you know, would you be interested? And she said, yes. And so she became head of our family and children's services section. And, you know, she was a pleasure to work with. Everybody in the office liked her. The judges all liked her. And the one thing that always sticks out in my mind was that when a child, uh, was going to be adopted. That was a big deal because that meant that there was a permanent home for a child that maybe had not ever had a permanent home before. And so on the first day that 
Kamala was going to be in charge of the adoption. She came into my office and said, come on, Louise, we're going over to court. And she had all these teddy bears in her arms. And she, I said, what are those teddy bears? She said, well, we're going to give everybody a teddy bear to remember the day. And so we did. And uh, I, I thought that was pretty special. Yeah, that's a great story. And now the, the rest is history. The rest is truly history. Well, I want to talk about that because we've mentioned Dianne Feinstein, who's still the senior senator yeah. from California. We mentioned Kamala Harris. There were other national politicians on the scene at that time. Gavin Newsom was about to be elected. He's now, he's now governor. Obviously, Nancy Pelosi was about to become the minority leader. What do you think it is in San Francisco that just these, these small 49 square miles, we've birthed so many sort of important national politicians? What's in the water there? Well, you know, that that is interesting that people s- laughingly say uh, it's it's the water and maybe there is something to that. But um, what I, it's, it, I think that if you take a look at San Francisco, there are actually a couple of things going on. First of all, we have to be one of the most diverse cities in the country, at least early on we were. And a lot of innovative thinkers a lot of new thoughts, etc., all seem to come from San Francisco. But the other thing is, too, there is a very strong conservative streak in San Francisco. And I used to say to Paul when I was campaigning for supervisor, city attorney, whatever, and, you know, you'd have to go all around the city. I would say to Paul, you know, this is like a trip around the world because you could be in a very poor place one hour, and in the next hour, a very palatial home in Presidio Heights. So it's a combination, I think, of the diversity of the city, the fact that you have both liberal and conservative. So I think you learn how to move ahead, if you will, to be aware of what people are thinking and to be planning on how to solve a problem. Because I think that there's always been a strong ability, if you will, to try to solve a problem. But you're right. I mean, we always had the both Phil and John Burton in the past, Willie Brown. I mean, the list goes on and on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too. There was at least at one point a, a real thriving local media scene, um, which I believe put candidates through the ringer as well. Um, and then the other thing is, like, it is tough to run in San Francisco. I mean, it, it, they play tough there. Um, it's not easy. And I wonder how you thought about that running um, in the 80s and the 90s. Did you relish a fight when it came to you? Well, I, for me, I I actually enjoyed campaigning. I liked to yeah. meet people. And in those days, too, I, I suspect it was a lot different than it is now. For example, uh, we, I used to go out and the, at the bus stops, for example, shaking hands. And then I loved the bingo games. There used to be people would have there would be these places where people would play bingo. And so you'd go in with your little card and you'd just very quietly slip it so you didn't bother their bingo and then oh then you'd contribute to the pot oh five dollars to the pot I think that was legal but <laughs> so I recall everybody did it so I don't know but uh, uh, so that was fun I was terrible at raising money that was to me raising money so is the worst thing possible I I was not good at that I am the first to admit it <laughs> So, so that brings us up to 2001, which is when you decided to not run again. W- why did you decide to not run again? Because it still seems like you were at the top of your game. Well, what had happened is our younger daughter, Chris, uh, was married to uh, Rick, still is. It was in the shipping container business, and they had two children, now have three, and they were moving to London, England. And so I just thought if they were moving to London with the demands on the schedule of being city attorney, I'd just never see our grandchildren. And, you know, family has always come first to me and to Paul. So that's why I decided that I, 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 it was time for me to do something different. And uh, then I thought, well, what I would do 
is try to run a foundation. I thought giving out money would be a lot of fun. Better than raising money. Yeah, instead of raising money, exactly, Sam. But uh, then what happened was there was a new superintendent at the San Francisco Unified School District, and she called me. Arlene Ackerman. Uh, Arlene Ackerman, exactly. And uh, she said, you know, Louise, I think we've got some real corruption in our district here. Do you think you can come over? And uh, at that time, they didn't have a real general counsel. They had relied primarily on the city attorney's office to the extent they used lawyers. But I thought, well, that would be interesting. And so, as a matter of fact, they did have corruption. We had some people go to jail, and and then we reached a, a verdict in one case of, I think it was $35 million, which was a huge amount in those days. So hopefully we got it, got it claimed up. But uh, that that was an interesting but difficult job. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure. And and after you left the SFUSD, at some point you founded what has now become the Rennie Public Law Group, which is really one of the main players in this space. Um, and I'm interested in hearing you talk about the difference between doing service in government and working in service in a civic-minded firm. And I wonder, as you think about giving advice to young lawyers, people who are interested in municipal law, how do you think about that? Uh, about whether to go into government or should you join a firm like the Rennie Public Law Group? How do you think about that? Well, um, one of the the things, uh, too, by the way, I should say that I also became the city attorney of the city of Richmond for a while, too. When their city attorney walked in one day and say, I quit. But anyhow, that's another story. But um, there's there are a lot of similarities. I mean, in our firm... We only represent public agencies or do uh, uh, nonprofits, or, and I do public interest cases. And there's a lot of similarities in, in many ways. For example, when we do investigations, which we do on behalf of public agencies, if there's a conflict in particular, um, you know, we're, we're in touch with all of the same witnesses that you would otherwise be. But we're very clear that, you know, we're, we're working for the city attorney or the board of supervisors, whoever's in charge. And, um, and then, and there's a variety when you're in private practice. It's not just, you know, the city of San Francisco that we're representing. There may be other, even more rural, uh, counties that we may be representing. So there's that. There's, the other thing is that um, I found today uh, that I'm doing shareholder derivative cases. Now, <laughs> what a thing to find out. Yeah. And uh, it's unbelievable. If anybody had told me that I would be doing shareholder derivative cases, I would have said, what? But here's the thing. What I discovered, thanks to some other lawyers I worked with, is that shareholder derivative cases, particularly today, have the ability to achieve justice. For example, one of the cases that is a shareholder derivative case is that I was involved in just last year in particular, was if you may recall, there were employees at Google who walked off the job because of the discrimination and the wrong practices that were occurring and that the wrongdoers left with 90 million and million dollar packages. So we actually filed a shareholder derivative case. This was harassment. Yeah. Correct. For, yeah. For Google, but in an effort to change practices. And so if you take a look at the Google settlement, for example, you will find there are a number of practices at Google that were changed, including the fact that they now have um, three outside people that uh, review some of the these matters, and they have a diversity, equity, inclusion council, which is a first. And so I think there are some important steps that were taken. Similarly, we filed lawsuit against Pinterest, where some real discrimination against some of the black women in the firm took place. And again, we just reached a settlement where I think there are going to be some big changes in how 
uh, preventing these kinds of things going on in the future. And as I say, have brought some lawsuits too, where we're trying to change at the top, uh, bringing in more diversity so that you get a different viewpoint. And I think it filters down throughout the workforce, as well as those who may be the, the outside contractors, at least that's the theory. So there's a real difference in terms of the kind of practice I'm doing now, which I, for lack of a better word, call public interest practice, as opposed to just representing particular cities and counties, although the firm as a whole continues to do that, and we will always continue to do that. <laughs> Is it your view that when you're looking for a young lawyer who wants to join the firm, that it's important that they have experience in government first? We do not. When we bring in lawyers, we do not um, have only lawyers who have only been in uh, public practice, but uh, it does make a real difference. There's there's just not once if you have that public uh, experience, you don't have the learning curve involved because there there is. Um, you know, there's a certain knowledge that is required as to how public agencies work and with whom they work and who the players are. Uh, you know, instead of CEO in a private practice, you'll have the city manager or the, or the county administrative officer. And uh, so there are some real differences and that kind of experience does make a difference. You know, this is, you know, our company focuses on issues of law and politics, and we have a lot of uh, listeners who are lawyers. And this is a very specific kind of law. And I wonder what makes a good municipal lawyer? What, what are the qualities that you look for? Well, I think some, some are pretty basic, and it might, might sound silly, but I think, obviously, I think a good public lawyer has to be a strategic thinker, if you will, that, you know, what what is the goal here? What is to be achieved? And what's the best way to go about it? So I think you need somebody who's not only honest and intelligent, and not tricky, but a good strategic thinker. What's in the public interest? What What does the public official want? And how do you go about achieving that goal in a legal way? So I think that makes a real difference. I think good oral skills, the ability to listen is critically important. And I think having good writing skills is also important because a lot of times there will be written transmittals that need to be provided. But I think a good listener and a good strategic thinker are, are keys to being successful. Yeah. And being a plaintiff's lawyer, which a public interest lawyer is, probably takes a little bit of different skills in the sense that um, you have a passion for justice, if you will, <laughs> and, yeah. and doing the right thing. Well, this has been such a pleasure, Louise. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Sam. It was a pleasure being with you. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.